John, thank you so much for your time today, just to have a conversation about. Yes, the senior man. Yeah, you too, John. So, the you know the 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 point of the conversation today is helping that business owner who's had one business, maybe 20, 25 years, maybe it's a man, maybe a woman, maybe it's a married couple or a couple of partners, whatever it is, but that one business that they've had that they've grown for years, they're experts in their space, and now they're realizing it's time for them to probably move on, sell it, somehow exit that business. They've never sold a company before. They know the company's worth a lot, probably millions of dollars, but they don't even know exactly what that number is worth. But uh, I'll give you a chance to introduce yourself. And then let's just talk about things they might want to look at or think about, questions to ask. So how about you introduce yourself and, and then we'll get started, John. Okay, thanks, Armando. I'm just John McAdam here. I'm a private business advisor, uh, usually for companies with 10 or more employees in the five to $50 million revenue space is most often where I serve. So I usually help people that are looking to double the revenue or prep for sale in three to five years. And I do that through one-on-one uh, -on -one private, private sessions and group and group sessions and workshops. Okay, fantastic. So this will be perfect for that, that founder who's thinking of that next step, wondering if they need to do some business cleanup or business practices cleanup or something. It sounds like you'd, you'd, be, the, you'd be in the right spot to be able to help them make maybe an initial assessment and help them just understand what matters when it comes time to sell. Does that sound about right? Yeah, yeah, I deal with it all the time. Okay. So I help, help your, you know, the listeners out, whatever they're potentially thinking about that you come across the most. Perfect. And what are, what are some of the, you know, for that, you know, first time person doing this, what are some of the things that are fairly common that you come across that maybe to them are just, they just had no clue or no idea that that even mattered? You know, what are some of the common things that you see happening and, and coming up? In, in, what, in preparing for sale, do you mean? Right. Well, right. You know, do they need to clean up the financials or clean up the employee, you know, the, the employee roster or business practices or all of the above? Yeah, it, it is kind of all of the above, but th some things are more important than others. Think, think of it like when you're getting ready to sell your car, most of us have sold a car before. And, you know, before you sell your car, you wash it, you clean the inside, you wax it, you make it look good, you know? <laughs> you, you Perfect. <laughs> Hopefully your car would look good, Armando, I'm not sure. <laughs> but, you know, you want to, so getting your financials or having your your bank account reconciled is, you know, is like having your balance sheet clean is like washing your car. It's, 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 it's something that doesn't draw suspicion. You know, if you showed up to buy a car and the car was dirty, you would ask lots of questions. Same thing when you're buying a business. If, if the financial statements look dirty, if, if the employees are in disarray and the, and the operations look unorderly, it, 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 it's scary to a buyer. So those are some common, common sense things that not everybody thinks about. Hmm. So, and I can see that, you know, businesses evolve and grow over time and business owners often get so busy with the company growing and, and the day-to-day -day that they, they might, sounds like maybe need to step out for a minute and take a fresh look at their business and, and maybe, you know, with someone like you to help them get that fresh look and see those things that maybe are not obvious to them. Yeah, I think it helps. I think it helps to be well advised. I, I also think it helps to have a plan in place uh, for when the time comes. It's all too often that, that people wait until the company starts losing money, has a bad year, and then they think about a sale, which is the worst, which is the worst time to think about selling or, or, you know, if, if some, if something bad health comes up, um, they think about it, you know, which is a tough time. So you want a good plan in place, a good exit strategy in place before, uh, you need to ha start doing it. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah, that does make sense. Cause so it's chaotic when you don't have one, it can be really chaotic, especially if you, if somebody passes away, and the, the, the spouse or the minority owner is left as a majority owner it, without, you know, an exit strategy in place. Um, it is very stressful on, the, on everybody else. 
Right, right. And, and we, you know, people for the owner himself, too, if he doesn't have the exit strategy in place. Sometimes people just burn out and they want to do something different, a different business or a different thing in life. And um, it helps to have a, a plan in place on what to do. So what about, John, what about a lead time? You know, you said maybe three to five years. You mentioned about someone wanting to sell in three to five years. What's a, a, a reasonable lead time for that business owner to begin actually taking some steps to prepare for sale? Yeah, we, yeah I, I think we did talk about this before because uh, you stole my thunder. Really, th three to five years is ideal. If somebody knows or if it's coming up at somebody 60 years old or 70 years old and they know they're not going to be doing it, three to five years is an ideal time because, you know, there's certain things that you want to do to maximize your value. I'm not, not to say that if you're running cleanly, you can't sell in, in, in nine months to 18 months. You can, but it's just stressful and chaotic, mm. you know, and you might not get the most value if, if you're doing it quickly. If you have to sell quickly, usually, you know, the business owner doesn't get the best price. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah that, that makes sense. And, and three to five years sounds like a, a, a long time, but you know, in, in that three to five years, what are you typically addressing in that business over that time? Yeah, pretty much everything. Um, but, you know, of course, of course, the money, of course, the, the financial situation, but uh, you know, one of the first things, if you know, if you have an exit timeline in play, you, you want to maximize your, your EBITDA or your net income to, uh, to maximize your value because it's the most common way people value companies is um, earnings before interest, and, you know, depreciation and taxes mm -hmm. and amortization. And you, you want to maximize that number. So there's things that, you know, you can do. And usually it's around the, 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 front, the basics of business, the, uh, Increasing revenue, increasing gross profit margin, uh, lowering expenses, um, and, and having a good budget. So sometimes if somebody's never had to go through a plan like that or work through those sorts of initiatives, it, it takes time for them to get good at it and shorten the impact between when you say, I'm going to grow this number and actually having it grow. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. So it's really looking from the, it sounds like looking at the business, just everything in the company, how it's run, the, the revenues, the product lines, maybe service lines, where you source materials, can you get things at a better cost, your, your employee roster, you know, right kinds of employees, just looking at everything in that company to get it to where it maybe makes the most sense and ends up with the, the highest net income at, at the end of the day, or it, it's not solely just the net income though, right? It's, it's other factors as well, or is it really that net income number? Um, well, it's, net income is probably the most important, most important number to drive, um, but there, there are other factors, obviously, the other, the assets of the company and how you're returning on them, um, you know, the, good, the goodwill, what, what is that number? Any intellectual property is a big one these days. Um, the venture capitalists or private equity firms, if there isn't something proprietary, usually, they usually don't like it as much. Usually prefer deals with some intellectual property behind them of some kind. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's an important number to have and thing to have for your company if, if it's available to you. And so what are you seeing out there? So, um, well, it's interesting here in Arizona, we have a lot of smaller companies. We don't have a lot of, you know, you're in Philadelphia, the Philadelphia area, and it's, it's very different where you are for the sizes of companies. Here, we have a lot of smaller ones and a real variety. You know, we're a service business. And so um, we're getting more attention now, getting more people, more Californians moving in. Yeah. And that's, you know, Housing prices are up in that, but a lot of different companies that are in, maybe in construction, you know, a lot of uh, real estate, um, but different areas. So, you know, intellectual property, you mentioned, I have a question on that for you. With intellectual property, is that typically owned by the company, owned by the owner of the business, or just 
one of the assets that's on the books on the balance sheet? How does that typically work? And what's really preferred with that intellectual property? It's a great question. I'm a former patent holder myself, so I've had a little bit of experience with it and helped others get patents. But usually the, the owner, the business owns the intellectual property, and you would want to transfer that intellectual property, which is an intangible asset, to the new owner. And the new owner typically would have a lot of, hopefully a lot of value assigned to that intellectual property. So mm -hmm. the inventor, the business owner usually might have a, their name on the patent or the business process or the trademark or whatever, but usually uh, you know, a good intellectual property lawyer will then transfer that right to the business as opposed to keeping it in the owner's name. Usually you only see, you see it in owner's name if it's a sole proprietor and that's the only thing the person's doing. But in a larger business, you, uh, you see it in the business owner, in the business's name. Hmm. Okay. What about, what about uh, you know, employees seem to be very difficult to find and retain these days. Um, so I would imagine that when, you know, when you're going through a company to help them maximize that value, Part of that might be employee retention, making sure the employees stick. Yeah, th there is a value in that. And um, there are certain tools that I use to help hire better and tools to help have more effective teams or better employee engagements because I can't help a company grow if they're having turnover. Mm -hmm. So I use some talent optimization tools to to hire better if that's what's needed, to have more effective teams, to have the right people together, uh, to do the work, the nature of the work. Okay. And, and make sure, you know, le leadership is engaged um, with their people. So I use people data uh, to help people do that, to help leaders do that, help managers do that, to help, to help business owners, you know, get things done through people. Because you really don't want a lot of turnover if you're buying a company, right? Right. right. There's usually some key employees involved in the operation and hopefully it's not just the owner. Right. So when you take the ownership out, what's left? And those are key employees and employees that the buyer would like to have stick around. And somebody, an astute buyer is going to, you know, put plans in place to, to make that happen. Mm -hmm. With employment agreements, with maybe retention bonuses and, and such. But, um, yeah, so you want to, if you're preparing for sale, you want to, you want to stabilize your workforce to the extent that you can, only so much of it's in your control, but you want to do the best you can to. Yeah. To keep and, it and John, when you're helping, when you're helping that business owner get that business, you know, going through the work that you do, how, how do you, I'm, I'm wondering what the employees, when they, when they see you poking around asking questions, uh, people like stability and if they think the company's about to be sold or possibly going to be sold or being positioned for sale that might make people nervous and i'm wondering how you how you navigate that as you're doing the work that you do yeah it's a, a good question again back back when i first started before you know pandemic years or the uh it, when I, it was an issue and i had to go in kind of uh, discreetly um privately sometimes even at night and that's not, hasn't been the case due to the virtual nature of the work. I'm on the telephone or, or online like we are. Uh -huh. The doors are closed and the, the, our conversation is hopefully private. So I'm not poking around the plant or walking around the office asking questions <laughs> <laughs> like I did a long time ago. And to, you don't have your white lab coat and your notebook. <laughs> right? It's never a good look for... Uh, Somebody sitting in a cubicle, right? That's right. Yeah, it might. But it's, but it's true. Even that said, even, even with the nature of most of the work being virtual, sometimes I do have to have to go in, and often the management team doesn't want me there. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Wow. So, are there are there uh, normal surprises or typical surprises that companies have, or do, when they when they bring you on board, or do they know they have? things that need attention and that's why they're bringing you? How, how does that typically work for you? Well, um, how typically, the average business owner thinks they need more money. When in fact, they probably, they probably need more customers. 
Mm, right. So that that's that's common sometimes. Um, probably the most common one I see. Okay. Because there's no sustainable form of financing like customer based revenue, right? Right. If you go out and borrow money, it's it's a limited amount. If it's you know, you get investor money, it's limited. If you get customer base, it's recurring. So often that's that's usually what they need. Um, but sometimes there's sometimes it's it's quicker, sometimes it's uh, they're spot on and they know, you know, I've got to get a management team around me because once if I sell the company, there's nothing left but there's nothing left. I'm the only I'm the only manager running. So they know they they need to take a, a few years to build out a team, uh, so the seller can have value assigned to it. Yeah, and, and it, it it sounds like what you're touching on is you know what is the what is the buyer really buying, and if that one person has all the knowledge and that one person is getting bought out, if there isn't that team in place, the key people in place, then what is that buyer really buying, right? No, it's true. And 100% knowledge transfer never happens mm. from the buyer's perspective. I've, I don't know, I've bought half a dozen companies in my career. You can, you can do your best and try your hardest. And it just, you'll never know everything that's in everybody's head. You'll never know why things are they are until you start changing them. Mm -hmm. Right. And the, um, so you have to, you have, but you, that said, you do, you, you can try, you can get it mostly right. And you can, you can, you know, as a buyer, you can spend a lot of time on, um, you know, transitioning, you know, the employee transfer and retention, uh, the customer transfer and retention, and you can do your best with it. And if usually, if you're, if you're trying your hardest and you're being patient, usually you get better results, you know, from the buyer's perspective, have some empathy. You want you want to make it as clean and easy for them as you can, the seller as you can. Mm -hmm. So they're trying, if you don't tell them, they have to write the answer the right questions or figure it out. And if they're from outside your industry, it's really, they're really in the dark. Mm -hmm. and, and does it matter if the buyer is a, you know, a competitor down the street or across the country or a private equity firm? I mean, when, when you're going in to do your work and, and help that company be prepared, does, do, do you tailor that work towards the desired type of buyer or does that not matter? That's a good question. I guess it, it depends on the company, but um, ideally you'd want to be able to address both a financial buyer, which would be a private equity company or a fund and, you know, or a strategic buyer, which might be somebody more in your industry. And depending on the industry, really determines which value you have, how profitable you are determines which, which way to go. Hmm. Wow. Well, like I said, we were saying it, it take, you know, three to five years is a, is a good number of years to have a runway to get that going, because it sounds like there's just everything that you're looking at and there isn't a quick fix to get things done. It takes time, especially when you're working with individual people and we're all individual people with different habits and characteristics of personalities to work with. Um, but I can see why you're saying three to five years really to really to have enough time to get things done right. Yeah, business owners are quirky, you know. They, <laughs> they're entrepreneurs and business owners because, you know, it's tough for them to work for other people. <laughs> they have some very unique habits and they're like doing things their own way like they want to do. I like it. I like work. I enjoy working with them uh, for that reason. Uh, one, of, one of many reasons, but, um, you know, it, now it's time to start thinking about somebody else taking over for you. You have to, you have to think about these things. Yeah. And so are the, are the business owners typically, you know, receptive, meaning, you know, when you say we have to do X, Y, and Z, typically receptive, or is there some pushback or how, how does that typically work? Uh, usually once we get in a rhythm, you know, you, well, you'll know, you'll know. I think, you know, because you really don't know what somebody's strengths and weaknesses are when, until you start working with them sometimes, mm -hmm. unless you're doing some kind of an assessment. But um, sometimes, sometimes owners aren't ready to sell. Right. You know, if they're not doing, if they're not willing to do the work to get ready to sell and maximize their value, they, you know, they might not be ready to sell. 
You know, if, if they want $10 million for a, a company that's doing $1 million in revenue, they might not be ready to sell. <laughs> and they might need you to help them build that up before they are ready to sell. Right, right. It's a pretty common number, by the way. I hear $10 million all the time. Oh, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> the smaller ones. I don't know why it's in people's head. And that may be that 4% rule people hear about. 4% of 10 mil is 400,000 a year. You know, yeah. so that's what, about 30, 35? Yeah, you got a problem if you can't live on that, right, Armando? <laughs> that's right. That's right. But, you know, it's interesting because, you know, people, uh, when we often meet people that are over age 50 and they're, they're, they're realizing they're going to step out of the company at some point, and then it's retirement and then beyond and having some kind of a, a nest egg built up for future generations. And they're, they're in such the mindset of investing in the company to build that value and build the portfolio that we have to do a mind shift of, well, now once you retire, once you sell that company, we've got to make sure you have enough monthly recurring cash that will support the lifestyle that you want. And that's a whole mental shift that, you know, when that happens after age 50, it's a whole lifetime of habits that now are a little bit, you know, it's a whole paradigm shift. You know, so yeah, I, think a lot, I think a lot of business owners don't realize that their, their life's work, their, life, their life's, you know, monetary value, not their life's value, but their, their business value, their, or their wealth, your life's wealth is, is really tied up in the business. And it's a, when it's tied up in a privately held business, it's a very illiquid asset. It's a very difficult thing to sell. It's not easy mm -hmm. to, to, find a, to find somebody to pay you fair value for, for that business. It isn't something that everybody can do is run that business and own that business. So it takes, it takes time. It, it takes the right people. It takes the right advisors to be to be around you to do it, and um, you know, it takes some work, but it's it's rewarding once you get there. And so, when they're ready to sell, I imagine you've got to assess through your experience whether they really are ready to sell. Are they going to do what you're telling them to do? Actually, take action steps to get there, or are they not? Um, how do you know when they're ready to sell? Uh, good question. Well, sometimes a life event makes them ready. A uh, divorce or a, uh, or a death, right? sad to say, or a um, um, bad health. Yeah. Um, where, or aging years is, is a common one where if somebody gets up in years and they don't have the motivation they do or the competitive. There's so many reasons that the competitive dynamics have changed. Um, they don't enjoy, enjoy it as much. There's so many different reasons why somebody's not ready to sell. But I think the, a, big, a big one is an understanding of what the business is worth. So if, so if a business owner has an unrealistic expectation about the value of their business and what they can get for it, that's when I most often hear a buyer say they're not ready to sell. So is a is a, a valuation sometimes a good place for them to really gauge? You know, are they ready or not? I mean, is it worth them to spend the money on an appraisal or a valuation, or or are there other ways to maybe get that um, that that number or that approximation where they don't need to incur that kind of a cost for an actual formal appraisal? No, it's a, it's a good question. I, I, I rule of thumb is. If, if the value of the business might wind up in court, get a certified appraisal. If, uh, if it's not likely to wind up in court, but, you know, a good business advisor, an accounting firm can do it. Um, you know, your tax guy can do it, can probably do it. Somebody like business advisors like us could do it. If we, uh, but, you know, I don't think it hurts for the, for what the business is worth and the, the money that's sitting in the business. I don't, I don't think an appraisal will ever hurt you. Mm -hmm. to have that knowledge. I, mean, I think it's, it's value to a private business owner looking to sell privately that's not in a hurry. I think it, it helps them understand what they can get for it. Are there, are there questions you think people should ask themselves, business owners should ask themselves when they're thinking about selling so they can, they can 
help themselves figure out are they ready or are they not? Is it time to sell or not? Are there key questions they should be thinking about so they don't, you know, maybe start walking down that path with the broker or an investment banker, then pull the plug before the process finishes because they really weren't ready? Yeah, yeah. The, the, for, the again, the first one is, is value. What are they? How much money do they want? You know, and and, and be specific. And how much can you reasonably expect to get out after you prepare this company for sale? I think is a, is is a great question. And to I think a business owner will know when they're ready. I think ideally, you, it's like uh, you know, a professional athlete. I mean, you want to. Some guys want to get go to the, to the last competing step, you know, their last competing breath. They want to stay in the game and compete. And, and other guys want to go out on top. Yeah. Other, other guys want to go out when they're still strong. And the, the business owner is just like that athlete. They got to they gotta figure out when do they want to transition. You're not going to be a business owner forever. I, I think one of the things I see a lot is, is do they have children to, to pass it on to? Mm-hmm. Can, can it stay in the family or not? Because that's that's something that where a lot of business owners take a lot of pride in those legacy type issues and helping their kids stay gainfully employed if they're capable and competent to, to, to run the business or prepare to run the business in some form of a succession plan. Yeah, and it, it seems like many adult kids aren't really you know willing to step up or, or ready to step up or necessarily want to, do what their parents have done with that company. Um, so that's not always the, I think a lot of, like I said, a lot of owners would like to see that. They, they would like that. Yes, they kids, would. Kids don't always want that though, unfortunately. <laughs> no, it's worth talking about because it's key to the question, like what do I have to think about to get ready to sell? And it might, maybe it's not one of the kids, maybe it's one of the a niece or nephew or extended family or in-law, you know, that, that, that could be it. But, um, you know, you want it to be somebody that knows how to hunt, you know, somebody that's hungry, you know, a little growl in their gut, a little spit in their eye, that's hungry to, to grow and make, you know, in a good ways. Yeah. And, you know, if, if, if the, the, the family line hasn't had to do that, it's going to be hard on them to go out and hunt and grow and uh, get aggressive and say no to people. And be unpopular, <laughs> right? Oh, right, right. And it's a lot of work to run a business, but you know, if, if they're lucky enough to have a, a father or mother who has a company, started it, and went through all those battles to build it, um, it's probably worth it for that adult child to at least take a serious look at it and see if it if it could make sense or might make sense for them to transition into that company. I agree. But for the family overall. Yeah, I agree. They, you know, and mo I don't know too many people that wouldn't prefer to keep their business in the family. Yeah. Um, but when they do, they the owner usually gets the, the least out of it. Huh. They're, they're usually very generous with their children and not as aggressive as they would be with a, with a, a buyer they don't know. So they maybe tend to understate the value, right? I, so I wish I wish more business owners when they when they want to transfer it to the children would still have a, have a good understanding of what a business is worth mm. and how to how to how to be fair to all parties, not just the children. Yeah, and so it sounds like part of what you would be doing then, John, is helping them think through some of those, talk through some of those, either key employees or adult children or other family members, and maybe different ways they could accept the business versus, you know, just sell. Is that part of what, what you end up doing with the clients you're working with then? Oh, definitely. Um, mostly it's a, mostly what, what I do is I work with the, the business owners to get the most value out of it. But um, so when I, when I transfer it off to a, uh, an intermediary, a, a business broker or an M and A person, if I'm not doing it, they, uh, you know, they'll, they'll go through more with the targeted uh, who, who we sell to. Mm -hmm. And, you know, can we create an auction? Can it be a financial buyer, a strategic buyer? Can it be a supplier, a competitor? Um, 
you know, somebody that's a platform company that's in this space that wants to, to, you know, to roll up some acquisitions, you know, can this company be a platform company when we do get some things going? Uh, those types of questions. Um, but it's usually the plan. It's usually the, the growth plan, the business plan, the, you know, the, the succession plans, the, the financial plan, the, 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 the people plan, um, or the big, the big ones. So you mentioned intermediary, investment banker, broker. How, how do each of those, why the broker versus the investment banker? Um, how, how does that work when you're helping to figure that out for the, the business owner? Uh, I th usually think of a business broker when it's more Main Street type businesses, and um, you know, and, uh, and mergers and acquisitions, uh, investment banker, intermediary when it's larger businesses. So, um, you know, five million might be. Think of it; it's kind of arbitrary. It used to be ten million used to be the cutoff in revenue, um, but now it's probably more like five. But um, you know, usually the smaller, those smaller companies are usually done by a business broker where the company doing five to 10 million and up would be uh, maybe more of an investment banker and then a, and that person, if they're profitable. Okay. Well, I imagine profits are always good to have in a company. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they really are. Because if, if the business isn't profitable, it might not be a good time to to sell, it might not. It's not a good time to maximize the value for the business owner uh -huh. if it's not profitable. Because really, if, if a business isn't profitable, unless it's tech or unless it's pharmaceutical or something that's very capital intensive business, uh, which then or it's like a SaaS, a software as a service type business that they expect losses and they're valued completely different ways. So outside of those spaces. Uh, usually a company that isn't profitable will sell to a discount of asset value. will sell for closer to asset value where a company this, if it is profitable, they'll sell for a multiple of earnings often. Mm -hmm. So often it, it seems like some people are very, very focused on fees and costs. And I've talked to some business owners who we're very leery about hiring that investment banker because of the fees or brokers because of the fees. They want to find their own buyer. And, and uh, I, I like to use an expression, having an expert in every corner, meaning that speak with the expert in that space and then decide what you want to do. You know, whoever the expert is, but speak with the expert so you have more information and you, you can make a more informed decision. So every, you know, the brokers, investment bankers, and intermediaries, Obviously, there's the cost, and if uh, if a business owner is, is wondering, well, should I hire someone like John to help me with that exit? There's a cost, of course, as well there. And net, if they if they knew they were come going to come out with a better number, and it was going to be too maybe too long of a process or too arduous of a process, too much work, then maybe they're more inclined to do that. Um, is there any way that that business owner can really? make that an easier decision-making process in, in your in your view? Well, I think you're, you're offering them good advice to what does it hurt to actually talk to somebody and find somebody you're comfortable with. I can, I can tell you a personal example. I mean, I was, I owned a company uh, once that I thought that too. I thought I could, I wanted to save the, 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 the six figures and fees or whatever. And I, so I tried to run the company and sell it myself at the same time. What I didn't know was that how much time that took, how I was having to, to work at night and day and weekends. And it was taking time, getting information ready, conversations. It was taking time away from actually running the company, running the business. And, and then there's the energy effect. It kind of drains you trying to do, but it's a full-time job almost selling a company. So, you know, these people aren't sitting around with their, feet on their desk there there's a lot of work to be done yeah and, and, it, and i don't it, think i understood that way back when way back when yeah but and it sounds like if if you're if you're trying to do both and trying to keep that company strong and healthy and growing uh, keeping the gas on the pedal to keep that company growth is important to get that price 
that they're thinking they might be able to get out of, out of that company. Yeah, because it, it, because it takes a long time to sell a company, you know, you get involved in exchanging information initially. You're like, oh, I can do this as a business owner. And all of a sudden you realize six months have gone by and you're, you know, you're, all you're doing is screening people. So you're, you're playing the role of, of uh, intermediary and it's exhausting, especially because not, you spend most of your time working on deals that never happen. I, I can tell you another quick story is uh, in a transportation company once that came to me, it was a while, a while ago, a little while ago, and he found a family business and they were, they were losing a little bit of money, not a ton, but uh, you know, they wanted this, they knew they wanted to sell, the owners were getting up in years. And, you know, I said, well, this is about what you're going to get if you sell now, this is what you'll get if, you know, we can wait and get the that income and EBITDA up to around here. And I didn't think they'd do it, but they, they worked with me for, for years. And we got, we worked, it took them a while to even work a budget, get a budget and deliver the budget. And we, we had an exceptional year. And right after that year, they decided the time's now and they sold for $12 million. I think had they, saw, had they sold when they first approach probably would have been more like four. Wow. So eight million dollar swing is how much you know how, how much are the fee are the fees worth it? It's immaterial. Right. Right. And that's a great example, John, that that investing the money, you know, in you and, and the, the team to come in and get that work done, it increased that value. And net they were ahead because of those steps. It's true. You know, now, now if, you, if you call them and ask them, they would probably tell you it was all them who did it. But that's, that's part of my job is to enable them, right? To right. have them internalize it and believe it. But, uh, but I know. <laughs> right. Well, sometimes it, you just need a good coach. <laughs> <laughs> a coach. Well, when you score the touchdown, you forget who called the play, right? Sometimes. <laughs> Uh, what, what have we not touched on yet, John, that, that, you know, doing what you do that, that you see as, as common or areas that really should just come out in the conversation we're having? Um, usually what I tell people is the, is, is in terms of an exit strategy is, um, is really have answer two fundamental questions, right? So you want to know about, if you want to just start a basic exit strategy, what's your company worth? Have a good idea of that. And the second question would be, who's likely to buy me? Who's likely to buy my company and make a list? Because if you have those two basic questions answered, whether you do it yourself or you do it with your, your team around you, most likely with your team, an advisory team around you, it's going to make their work a lot easier. Okay. And, that, and a lot comes out of that. A lot of those two questions, you know, a lot, a, a bigger, broader exit strategy starts to, to come out as far as the timing goes. But when I used to teach strategic business planning, that's, that's to small business owners, that's what I used to, those, those how I got them started. That mm -hmm. good work. So what's your business worth and who's the likely buyer? A list of who the likely buyers might be. Yeah. Hmm. And you find out what your business is worth by knowing investment bankers or business brokers. You know, there's some online sites that that you can figure out what companies are selling for, which is the best data. Um, and who might buy me really is start with a list of customers, start with a list of competitors, uh, suppliers. And that's usually a, a good place to start. Um, and maybe venture capital firms in the area, uh, in the in the industry specific space, stuff like that. Um, I hope that I hope that helps. I hope that helps your yeah. Listening. Are there types of industries that you like, John? I mean, when you're when you get a call from somebody in a certain industry, do you sometimes light up that it's oh, it's in this industry? It's just appealing for whatever reason. Yeah, I guess I guess most of my work has been around business services. Um, I always I always think manufacturing is fun because it's hard. You know, when you have all the uh, the materials and inventory and people and specialists, and 
it's hard. So I, I, I enjoy that. The, the, some, the allied health and medical spaces are kind of fun, you know, um, and, uh, you know, but it's, it's really industry agnostic. I think I've been involved with every type of industry so far. I think education is kind of fun because I was a professor for a while. So, um, and something new is always fun too. Mother. It really is. Just to kind of figure it out and dig in and see what's there and how it works. Yeah, no doubt. Hmm. Okay. So I, I've, what, what about due diligence? You mentioned about you know, how you know, six months in and you realize you're still getting papers and funneling people who maybe are not really the right buyer deals that don't actually happen. That, you know, that whole due diligence that happens when a buyer is looking at a company to, to purchase, uh, the due diligence can take a lot of time. How, how far back, when they're doing their due diligence in the company, how far back are they typically going? How many years? Um, five, usually the IRS standard would be five to seven years, most commonly five. Um, still want five years of financial state, all kinds of financial statements, income statement, balance sheet. Um, a business plan becomes really important, but uh, like any stockholders, meetings, board meetings, those types of minutes would be really important. Insurance policies go back. They're really important because they can come into play in the future after the, uh, the business is purchased. Um, but it really does help to have a, a rather lengthy checklist uh, of information to get, to get ready for a seller. So I think if a, if a buyer takes time to talk about that while we're shopping around, like what kind of checklist with, you know, with his intermediary or his advisors, he can start getting it ready and love most of it done by the time they engage. But there's always a level of depth and, the, you know, a good broker or investment banker would hopefully get you involved in more depth than you will go in with a potential buyer. Hmm. So that depth usually is involved lots of information. But some buyers just have focuses on different things. And some, buy some buyers are more focused on the uh, customer. Some buyers are more focused on the people. And so more, more due diligence type questions come up in those areas. But due diligence can take a long time. And it's, uh, the, the due diligence is usually longer if the company is not profitable because people will have more questions. If the company's highly profitable and you can, you can see that, it, there's, you know, I just, it's just a trend that I've noticed that people do, tend not to ask as many questions when a, the company's highly profitable and it can be proven. And this goes without saying, and you've probably, I'm sure you've told your clients this, but you want to get reviewed financial statements or, you know, most small businesses don't get audited financial statements, but a buyer's usually more comfortable with something that's been you know, stamped and approved by an, a certified public accountant or an accounting firm. Yeah. So some level of assurance, either a review or an audit that an outside third party has come in and taken a look at those numbers and they've given either, either reviewed financials or audit, but somehow given an opinion. And then it's an outside third party kind of blessing those to some extent, those financials. It really is because it's scary for a buyer because some business owners, I mean, have their hand in the, in the till, <laughs> hand, their, their hand in the cookie jar and they, and buyers don't like that, you know, and, or it's not that they don't like it. They just want to know what, how many cookies are taken out of the cookie jar, what kind of cookies are taken out, you know, and, and a lot of times a seller would be very uncomfortable disclosing that, but it's something that a seller, ha if they got to get comfortable with it, because every business owner is trying to minimize their taxes, right? So right. you're going to put your automobile through it. You're going to you're going to put some personal expenses that are discretionary through it, right? You do extra health insurance, or you know, above market rate rent, or um, you know, you know, restaurant money, whatever, whatever, whatever it is, entertainment. Um, those types of expenses can really add up. And the good news is for the, the um, seller um, is that they get added back to net income uh, during the valuation often. Mm -hmm. 
as you know, the buyer might not know it's seller's discretionary expenses. Anything that's discretionary that might be paid personally or through the business can be added back, and that gets added to the income calculation, which is which is really a good thing. So to actually be in disclosure about it, um, you got to get comfortable with it as a as a seller. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I agree hundred percent that you know often the goal is to minimize taxes on the business tax returns, which of course is, is gonna to lead to the personal returns often. So you might throw extra expenses in there that really are maybe more gray because you can, maybe personal cell phone use or other things that they just can add up. Um, but if the mindset is three to five years out to sell, probably wanna look at those discretionary items and do they really belong in those financials or not? Because it sounds like it will impact or could impact the value and the selling price of that business when it comes time to sell. It, it could. Uh, I think, you know, you want to, it's an awkward conversation to have and you're, 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 you're very tactful with how you expressed it, Armando. But, uh, you know, I, this, like the cell phone, let's take that. I mean, your family's cell phones can or you are often on the business account. I mean, do you need to back those out? They need to be backed out at some point. And I think it's as long as it's disclosed, I don't think it matters. Um, but it makes it real darn clear if they are backed out. And, you know, while you're getting your car ready to sell, or you're getting your business ready to sell, if, if, you, can, if you can do those sorts of things, I think it makes it real clear for the, for the buyer, the future buyer. And but you can also accomplish the same thing by seller's discretionary expenses too. And the intermediary or, or um, a business broker can explain those. Okay. And they're very common. So I don't think you have to, but um, it leaves no doubt when you do take them out, seller's discretionary expenses. It sounds like part of, part of what you're doing is, is, is uh, coming in with a, with a master checklist as well as you're looking at the different components of the business and just going through each of them to see if they are where you think they should be. Is that part of what you're looking at when you're looking at the companies? Um, it's, um, a little bit, a little bit. You, usually, I, I'm, um, usually I'm helping them grow. So I'm helping them grow revenue, I'm helping them acquire customers, I'm helping them maybe do a, a small acquisition or a medium-sized acquisition. But I'm helping them buy a company. Mm. When you buy a company, you really get comfortable with selling them too. Um, so, you know, a lot of times somebody will buy companies to just for, as a prepare for sale process, right? You can grow a company much faster buying other companies than you can growing it internally. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because you, you certainly could consolidate a few or a couple of smaller companies, make it a bigger company. And that would increase the overall value, the overall, uh, just the overall net in their pockets. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, you can buy customers, you know, you can buy employees, you can buy intellectual property, you can buy assets, things of value, distribution hmm. channels um, that just take years to, to, to build up. Um, and you can do it quickly. It's a sales cycle is very long when you're doing it organically. It's very quick. You, it can be very quick if you're doing it through acquisitions, and it's it's a good it's a good growth strategy to prepare for sale and maximize value if you're in acquisition mode. Hmm. Wow. Well, it sounds like you're looking at it a lot, and you can really be helpful as that business owner is wondering, you know, what does that exit look like? When is it going to happen? And how is the family going to be after the sale? And what's that picture going to look like for them as well? Yeah, and, and, and you, you know, I'm sure you do something similar in that vein. That, you know, you're you're looking at their, you want to help them accomplish what they want to accomplish. Right, exactly. You know, I had a, a, a medical practice recently that almost sold, and but they decided not to. And it was a multi million dollar deal, and they decided not to because the the buyer really wanted them to. Uh, be more of a business business people and not doctors after they were acquired. Mm. Um, so it was 
uh, that, I can't get into details, but I can tell yeah. you that uh, that wasn't desirable for the, the seller. You know, they, they, the sellers wanted to practice, continue to practice medicine and have some business exposure. So just as one example of, it's not always about just the money. Uh, it's also about who you're selling to. And if the company you've worked your life so long for is going to be taken care of, at least mostly how you would. You know, that's, and if, you're, if you have to stay on with the uh, seller for a year or more, you want to make sure you're doing the type of work that you want to do. So that's why I bring it up. But yeah, yeah, so there is, there is, I don't have, there are checklists, there are uh, things to prepare for, there's, there's a lot to do to, to get somebody ready to sell. And it sounds like part of what's important as you're, as you're engaging with somebody is determining, you know, what really are they trying to get to? Maybe not, maybe it's money, maybe it's a lifestyle. But what are they really trying to get to? Because that sounds like it will impact the work that you do in that business. Yeah, I think it would impact any any business advisor for the business owner to, to really understand that. Now, some people don't know. Some people can't imagine what it's like not to work or right. to run a business. Like the business becomes part of their personality, but someday they have to disengage from that and think about life after ownership and what that looks like and to share that. And if they don't know specifically to share what it might look like, what it might be, or what sounds like a good idea, you know? Right. We're still asking what we want to do when we grow up, even when we retire. <laughs> right? Right. Yeah, we'll, we'll often ask about, you know, the, the values that the couple has. It's often a couple that we are meeting with. And one typically has the business, one is not involved in the company typically. But we'll ask about the values that, that the, the, the couple has and then what are their goals and try to get you know, try to get this to line up and come together so that whatever decisions are made really are in alignment with those values and those goals. And what we've all we, we've had before though where we'll go through that exercise and we revisit that every you know at least once a year to make sure that nothing has changed in their picture. But uh, even when we had a, an instance just, not too long ago where a business owner wanted to have something, have enough uh, financial capacity to do certain things for the family and that. And then in that process, we learned the real value of the company, which was substantially more than that business owner thought. And I came back to the couple and said, those goals you said you wanted for your family, you're there now. Oh, wow. What do you want to do? You know, but they were at that inflection point where they could sell the business and, and, and reach those goals that they wanted. But they, they took those off the table and said, no, we want to continue growing this company, not ready to exit yet. Um, so even though the values and goals may be, may be defined at a certain point, those goals can certainly change as life changes. And they, they could be in the future, not the present. Right, right. right. And I've had the I've had the opposite as well, where a, a business owner wanted to have a company, wanted to have a net worth of uh, his goal was fifty million dollars between his business and everything else, and and he was about there. And I remember saying that, well, this is what you said you wanted, and if that's what you want, then you really need to start looking at exiting that business and beginning that process because you're there. And he didn't want to do it just. Thought it was too soon. The uh, the industry changed. Federal changes came in that just destroyed the business, and so that value that was there, it it just evaporated. Which is, you know, horrible because it's it's sickening, but uh, that happens. It does. It does. It happens. You know, we, you and I talked earlier about you know a business being a really illiquid asset, a very difficult thing to sell, and I think. To any business owner listening, I, I would, if if you can get out for your a price that you want, it's a good it's good to get out for that reason because regulations change, competition changes, employees turn over, you know, customers go come and go, and they, things can change pretty quickly. So if you get to the point, you know, where you can get out at what you what you want to get out at, I would advise. I would just take a long look at it. Now, for them, they know, and sometimes it's just part of their lives, and they can't disconnect from that, right? And um, right. 
Right. So you know, it's 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 hard to watch as right. an advisor when you're in that situation, but you have to respect the business owner's decision, whatever it is. Right, right, and the you know the identity tied to that company or tied to that you know to whatever that person is doing for their entire life. Sometimes, like you said, they do have to disconnect and they have to be comfortable that it's going to be okay when they no longer are tied to that company and being in that role any longer. Yeah, so thinking about what they're going to do in retirement or their next business they're going to start or even their retirement business. Some people have retirement businesses. Right. Um, you know, it, it's important. And it's, it's outside, often outside the business area, but the business people can help you get started with it. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. So, John, anything that we haven't touched on, you know, we've touched on a, a, a several different areas that, you know, that the business owner has to really think about and just, you know, really have a, a, a deep dive into what's important to them. And then, you know, when that time is right, then take those steps. But anything that we haven't touched on that you've seen with uh, other clients you've helped, businesses you've helped that, you um, might be worth just mentioning? I, I think we covered the basics without getting too much into the weeds here, without getting too much into the detail. I think the basics are, are the most important when somebody's just getting started with thinking about selling. I was, and I would just keep it simple and start there. I don't want to get into too much detail here. Yeah, yeah. And it sounds like, you know, coming back to really, are they ready? Are they mentally ready to let go of that company, let go of that identity and take that next step. Are they really ready? Yeah, and I think what you're, what you're alluded to really is sometimes it's, it's more, has nothing to do with business, whether they're ready. It's more emotional, it's more right. identity, it's more, you have to get past that first and, and, and you know, kind of be, at least be leaning one way or the other, right? Right, and I, I've seen that, you know, often it, it can take a, a person when they retire, it can take 18 to 24 months to where they really feel comfortable and, and they know it's going to be okay. Now that they're retired, it's going to be okay. So that, that is a normal, as I've seen, a normal uh, transition time. It's a normal human feeling, emotion to, to go through that, that loss of no longer being day-to-day -day in that grind. So uh, hopefully they've had some time to think about what they want to do once they aren't working and they can begin to fill that time in their mind so they can start to do it when they actually decide that it's time for them to sell. I just imagine every day being a Saturday, right? <laughs> what to do? Right. Have you had any, have, have you had any interesting, uh, have you heard anything really interesting about somebody who's, who's going to sell their company, what they've been to do afterwards? The most common thing I hear is people want to want to be. They want to do what I do. They want to help other help other small businesses grow and excel. And I'm like, wait, <laughs> I hear that one a lot. I'm like, you guys think it's easy, huh? <laughs> you don't think this is a grind too? Come on, come on now. You think it's easy? They think it's a retirement business to do what I do. Maybe to think of it more as giving back, since they yeah, through it. You know, a lot of people that I talk with. They feel a responsibility to give back to their family, to the community, to the world, and give back either money or time or, but they somehow want to give back. Maybe that's, maybe that's what they're saying rather than your job looks easy, John. They <laughs> <laughs> say it in just, because I know that's one of the reasons I started too. When I sold a company, I wanted to give back. And in that process, I realized how much I liked this type of work, you know. And help people getting through it. So, well, thank you so much for the conversation, John. If, if somebody listening wants to reach out and give you a call or email you, what's the best way that they should be able to contact you? Um, Pioneer Business Ventures is my company. So, pioneerbusinessventures.com, John at Pioneer Business Ventures, which is plural.com, is a good, good email. And the phone is 609 460 4531. That's 609. Okay. Four six zero four five three one. Thank, Thank you, Armando. I think you've hopefully somebody listening to this has never sold a business before. Will be more comfortable now than they were 
when they first started listening. Yep, yep. And, and that's the idea that getting the right expertise and having some people to talk with and, and making the right decisions versus making the wrong decision and regretting that later. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Good. But John, thank you so much. Yeah. Really appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you again, too. You too. We'll catch up again another time.